Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd fa inshallah this is the third reading naam of the book entitled al awsat uh, this the third reading in totality including the biography of the book entitled al awsat fi sunani wal ijma'i wal ikhtilaf by Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Mundhiri rahimahullah ta'ala who died in the year 318 after the Hijrah and ibn al-Mundhir rahimahullah ta'ala he began his book as we covered last time with the section dealing with purification or the the books the the, the subject matter in the first portion of his book being purification and he began the topic of purification by starting with the chapter that covered the obligation of purification that which has been transmitted regarding the obligation of purification what is obligatory or what is obligatory to do in purification from uh wudu and ghusl etc he talked about the the foundation in it, the ayah and he talked about in it the meaning of the ayah. Now, and he talked about some of the meaning of what was connected to that as far as what is obligatory from purification, whether it be wudu or taking a ghusl, and how the scholars are all in agreement that an individual, before they can pray, they need to remove the hadith. And we talked about uh, some of the things that related to Al-Hadith. And we talked about some of the views that relate to the Hadith, or the, the, the purification from Hadith, the Wudu. Is it for every Salat, or is it uh, for the person who is in a state of Hadith? Is he the only one who needs to purify himself? Or is the purification something that is for every salat? Or was it for every salat for the prophet and then abrogated upon him? Or did that ayat even have anything to do with the salat, generally speaking? Or was the ayat more specifically about the obligation of purifying yourself after breaking the hadith through sleep? And we mentioned that, which inshallah doesn't need to be repeated. After mentioning all of that, though, and now that we know the obligation of purifying ourselves with wudu and with ghusl and when we need to purify ourselves, which is when we intend to pray after we have committed a hadith, the author, he's now going to go into the comprehensive topic of what things cause a hadith. What things cause a hadith. And this is because if you know that you need to make wudu or a ghusl, or should we say in a better term, you need to have tahara. After you commit a hadith, you need to have tahara after you commit a hadith. Then what are the things that cause the hadith? That you must make tahara for its sake. And so he's going to mention all of the things that he can, or that he's come across, or that he can recall at the time when he composed this. All of the things that necessitate or result in a hadith. The things that cause a hadith. And Ibn al-Mundi rahimahullah ta'ala, he was very clever in his organization of the book. If you look at the title of the book, he breaks it down. The middle or the medium sized book that relates to the sunan, those legislated rulings as well as the consensus, as well as the disagreement. And so the way that he organizes this topic is that he begins off the things that the Quran proves they cause a hadith. And then he mentions after that, the thing that the Sunnah proves they cause a hadith. And then he mentions after that, the things that there is unanim uh, uh, unanimous agreement that they cause a hadith. And then he mentions the unanimous agreement about things that don't cause a hadith. 
And likewise, he mentions after that the things where there are disagreement, if they cause a hadith or not. And like this, he covers all of it from the legislated rulings that have come in the text, the Quran and the Sunnah, as well as the consensus, as well as the disagreement. And inside of each of those chapters, he has a secondary categorization uh, that inshallah we'll see in his uh, opening of, of, the, of the chapter and where he covers that which necessitates a wudu, that which necessitates a ghusl, that which necessitates something and there's disagreement over what it necessitates. And likewise, that which is necessitates a wudu from the sunnah, that which necessitates a ghusl. And we'll let the author's work speak for himself from this point out. So he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and, and, and try to pay close attention to the organization of the author. If you are able to make that mental map of what the author is saying, then you'll be able to, you need to still, <clears throat> to completely comprehend and acquire and uh, uh, retain the the information that he is presenting because he presents it in a way that if you can make the mental map of what he's saying, you'll have a, a strong foothold in understanding these topics and points. Ibn al-Mundir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Jima'u abwab, uh, the, the comprehensive topics of this. Yani, what are the topics of purification? These next section, this is going to be everything you need to know about purification. All right, everything that you need to know about this tahara that he began his book off with, these chapters that are about to, uh, uh, these preceding chapters will be everything you need to know. They are a comprehensive chaptering regarding the purification. Jima'u abwab. Uh, the comprehensive chapters regarding the subject matter. The first of them, he says, Those ahdath, those ahdath is the plural of hadith. We said this is a word that we don't want to translate. We don't want to translate the word hadith. You need to understand it in Arabic as it is because there's no suitable translation for it. And al-hadath is a quality or uh, a state that happens to an individual that prevents him from being able to make salat and things similar. When one of these actions happen and it places your body in a state where you are no longer able to make salat until you purify, then that is what is called a hadith. Wasfun qa'imun bil bedani temna'u min salati wa nahwiha. It is a quality or a state that the body becomes in. It's a state of being for the individual that when he is in that state, he is unable to make salat or things similar to it. And thus the removal of that hadith is purification. And we said that the hadith is two types, minor hadith, which requires a wudu, and major hadith, which requires a ghusl. And like this, the author, he says, what are those ahdath? What are those hadiths? the plural, what are those ahdath that indicate the obligation of purification that have been presented or mentioned in the book or the sunnah or the agreement of the scholars of the ummah? What are the ahdath that have been mentioned in the Quran, the sunnah, and the ijma of the ummah that indicate one that it's been indicated or let's word this a different way what are those ahdath that are proven in the book the sunnah and that which the scholars of this ummah agree upon necessitate wudu what are those ahdath that are proven in the book and the sunnah 
and the that which the scholars agree upon, they necessitate or they obligate upon the individual to make wudu. They necessitate purification. They necessitate purification. Now, what are those ahdaf that are proven in the book, the sunnah, and the consensus of the scholars of this ummah that they necessitate purification? Abu Bakr, rahimahullah, he says, qala jumala, uh, uh, <clears throat> جمل فرض الطهارة مأخوذ إما من كتاب وإما من سنة وإما من اتفاق علماء الأمة فأما ما علمته مأخوذا من كتاب من الكتاب فهو يفترق على ثلاثة أوجه فوجه منها يوجب الاغتسال ووجه منها يوجب الوضوء ووجه ثالث أجمع أهل العلم على وجوب الطهارة منه واختلفوا في كيفية الطهارة التي تجب فيه أبو بكر رحمه الله تعالى he says the uh, to be concise or the the summarization of that which the obligation of purification for it is able to be derived from either or the things that the obligation of purification is necessary for them are either derived from the book or the sunnah or that which the scholars of the ummah are in agreement with i those things that there is evidence that an individual has to make purification or tahara because of them are either taken from the Quran, the Sunnah, or the agreement of the scholars of this Ummah. He says, so as far, so as it relates to, or as, as it relates to that which I've known to be derived or taken from the book, then, i.e. from the Quran, what are the things that the Quran proves from what purification is necessary for it he says as far as those things that i know them to be taken i.e., the evidence for them is taken from the book then they are divided into three aspects the first of them is that which is or that which bathing or al-ghusl is necessary for it and the second of them is that which a wudu is necessary for it. And the third of them is that which the scholars agree <clears throat> that there is, an, uh, there is an obligatory purification for it, but they disagree about how that purification should be done. Now, what he's saying here is, is that the, the things that we need to purify ourselves because of, the only place that we get that information from is the Quran, the Sunnah, or the consensus of the scholars. There's no other source to know that which nullifies one's purification. And since this is the case, we shouldn't look for the answer to what nullifies our purification and places us into a state of hadith, except from these three sources the Quran, the Sunnah, and that which the scholars of Islam agree upon. He says that, and these three sources, as it relates to the first of them, which is the Quran, then that which the Quran proves necessitates a hadith is one of three things, one of three categories. That which the Quran proves, you need to take a ghusl because of it. So the Quran states something, and what it states is that you need to take a ghusl because of this action. The second of them is the Quran, and, and it necessitates that you have to take a wudu, meaning the Quran states something, and the thing that it states necessitates that you have to make a wudu because of this action. And the third of them is something that is in the Quran and all of the scholars agree that whatever Allah was talking about, it necessitates a purification. But they disagree about what Allah is talking about and thus they disagree about the type of purification that it necessitates. So there's three things, three categories that the Quran proves. The Quran proves what you need to take a ghusl because of it. The Quran proves what you need to take a wudu because of it. And the Quran proves what you need to do some type of purification because of it. 
but the scholars disagree about what type of purification is necessary. He says, وَأَمَّا مَا عَلِمْتُهُ مَأْخُوذًا مِنَ السُنَّةِ فَهُوَ يَفْتَرِقُ عَلَى وَجْهَيْنِ وَجْهٌ مِنْهُ يُوجِبُ الْإِخْتِسَالِ وَوَجْهٌ مِنْهُ يُوجِبُ الْوُضُوء فَالْوَجْهُ الَّذِي يُوجِبُ الْوُضُوء مِنْهُ يَفْتَرِقُ عَلَى أَوْجِهٍ عَلَى أَوْجِهٍ ثَلَاثَةٍ مِنْهَا مَا يَجِبُ بِخَارِجٍ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ جَسَدٍ الْمَرْءِ وَمِنْهَا مَا يَجِبُ بِالطَّعَامٍ بِالطَّعَامٍ يَنَالُهُ دُونَ سَائِرِ الْأَطْعِمَةِ وَمِنْهَا مَا يُوجِبُهُ زَوَالُ الْعَقْلِ بِالنَّوْمِ نعم He says, and as for what I've known to be taken from the sunnah, then this is divided into two aspects or two categories. The first aspect is that which the sunnah establishes, the obligation of taking a ghusl because of it. And the second or the other aspect is that which it establishes, the obligation of a wudu. And as far as it relates to that which establishes the obligation of a wudu, then this is also divided into three aspects. That which it, i.e. the sunnah, establishes you need to make a wudu because of it, because of something that left your body, something that came out of your body. Something that came out of your body caused you to need to make a wudu because of it. And the second of them, I, the next aspect, is that which is necessary for you to make a wudu because of something you ate. Specifically, as opposed to all of the other things that could be eaten. And the third aspect is that which it, i.e. the sunnah, necessitates that you have to make a wudu because of the loss of your faculties or your comprehension, your intellect, by way of sleep. So, <clears throat> if the categorization is the Quran, then the Quran proves three things. The first of them is what you need to take a ghusl with. This is the Quran. It proves what you need to take a ghusl. It proves what you need to take a wudu because of it. And it proves what you need to do something. But the scholars disagree about what that something is. This is what the Quran proves. The next section that he'll have is that which the sunnah proves. And the sunnah proves two categories or two aspects. That which you need to take a ghusl and that which you need to take a wudu. And as far as it relates to the sunnah, then the things that you need to take a wudu because of, then they are three aspects as well. That which you need to take a, ghusl, a wudu because of something that came out of your body. The second of them is that which you need to take a ghus, a wudu, because of something you put in your body from food. And the third of them is that which necessitates a wudu because of your loss of intellect or faculties of reasoning and comprehension by way of sleep. So these are the first two categories that he said we should be looking for. And he mentioned that there are three. So the third one of them is the consensus that which the scholars of the Ummah have agreed upon. He says, وَأَمَّا مَا عَلِمْتُهُ مَأْخُوذًا مِنِ اتِّفَاقِ الْأُمَّةِ فَهُوَ يَفْتَرِقُ عَلَى وَجْهَيْنِ وَجْهٌ يُوجِبُ الْإِخْتِسَالِ وَوَجْهٌ يُوجِبُ الْوُضُوءِ He says, and as far as that which I've known it to be taken from the agreement or the, 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 the consensus of the scholars of this Ummah, then it is in two aspects. The things that necessitate Tahara from the Ahdath that are proven by the consensus of the scholars, then they are two categories. The first of them are things that necessitate a ghusl, and the second of them are things that necessitate a wudu. So, like this, he covers the three categories that we're going to be learning from as it relates to the Sunnan and the Ijma'. 
He says, وَيَبْقَى نَوْعَانِ مِمَّا يَخْرُجُ مِنْ جَسِدِ بِنِ آدَمْ أَجْمَعَ أَهَلُ الْعِلْمِ عَلَى تَرْكِ وُجُوبِ الْوُضُوءِ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا He says, and that leaves two categories of things that the that are expelled or that come out of the body of the child of Adam. <clears throat> that leaves two more categories of things that could possibly come out of the child of Adam. The first of them are things that the scholars are in agreement that it does not necessitate a wuvu. The first of them are things that the scholars are in agreement that it does not necessitate a wuvu. Things that come out of your body and there is an agreement that it does not necessitate wuvu. He says, وَاخْتَلَفُوا فِي وُجُوبِ الطَّهَارَةِ مِنَ النَّوْعِ الثَّالِثِ وَتَبْقَى أَبْوَابُ سِوَى مَا ذَكَرْنَا يَدْفَعُ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ أَنْ تَكُونُ أَحْدَاثًا تَنْقُضُ الْوُضُوءِ وَيَدْعِي آخَرُونَ أَنَّهَا أَحْدَاثٌ تَنْقِضُ الطَّهَارَةِ وَأَنَا ذَاكِرٌ تِلْكِ الْأَبْوَابِ بَعْدَ فَرَاغِي مِنْ مَا اِبْتَدَأْتُ بِذِكْرِهِ إن شاء الله. He says, and they disagree or they differ, i.e. the scholars, regarding the obligation of purification for the second type, i.e. other things that come out of your body that there isn't an agreement from the scholars. And it isn't something established in the authentic sunnah. Instead, it is from the category of things that the scholars disagree about. So they differ regarding the obligation of purity or purification for the second category. And there are some topics or chapters besides what we mentioned that some of the people or a, a large number of the people of knowledge reject these things being causes of hadith and things that nullify the wudu and a different group of scholars claims that they are the causes of hadith and nullifiers of purification and I'm going to mention all of these topics, inshallah, after I finished from the things that I mentioned that I would begin with, with Allah's permission, or inshallah, if Allah wills. So he's laying down in his introduction the blueprint for this first section. We're going to look to establish what causes a hadith from the Quran, the Sunnah and that which the scholars agree upon. That's our source. Now that we know our source, when we look at the Quran, we're going to see that the Quran establishes three aspects. That which the Quran establishes from the things that require a ghusl. That which the Quran establishes from the things that require a wudu. And that which the Quran establishes from the things that require something. And the scholars disagree about what that required thing is. The scholars disagree about what that required thing is. Then he's going to transition to talk about what has been established through the authentic sunnah. And what the sunnah establishes according to the author are two categories. The first of them is what the sunnah establishes that there is a ghusl needed because of it. And the second of them is what the sunnah establishes that there is a wudu needed because of it. And as far as it relates to the second, the things that require a wudu based on the sunnah, then they are three aspects as well. The first of them is that which requires a wudu because of something you take into your body. I'm sorry, something that you expel from your body. The first of them is something that requires a, a, a wudu because of something that you expel from your body. The second of them is something that requires a wudu because of something you take into your body. And the third of them is something that requires a wudu because of your loss of intellect and your faculties through sleep. 
And then the third source being the consensus or the agreement of the scholars that establishes what requires a tahara in two aspects. That which requires the tahara of a ghusl and that which requires the tahara of wudu. And like this, he finishes the things that he intended to begin with. And then he'll transition into the third category, the next category of things that there is an agreement that they do not require to hollow from the things that come out of your body. There are things that come out of your body that there is an agreement that there is no tahara necessary for them. And then he'll go into the next section, which are things that come out of your body where there is disagreement about do they require a tahara. And so some scholars say they do not. And he used the word a lot of scholars say that these things do not require a tahala. And then there is another group of scholars who claim and assert that these things do require tahala. Even though they're not from the first three categories, according to the author. And like this, he's going to mention all of that and all of this disagreement. After he mentions the things that they are established in the Quran, the Sunnah, and the consensus. And like this, we see the blueprint of the author when he says, this is a medium-sized book regarding the Sunan, the legislated rulings that have come in the Quran and the Sunnah, for example, and the consensus and the disagreement. And so like this, he's going to establish it one at a time. We'll take the first chapter, things that the Quran established that you need to take a ghusl because of them. And we keep saying the word ghusl because we don't like to use the word bath or shower because these realities are not the reality of a ghusl. The ghusl is a religious term that has a specific set of requirements, while a bath doesn't meet those requirements and a shower doesn't meet those requirements meaning you can take a shower and not take a ghusl and you can take a bath and it not be a ghusl and you can take a ghusl in the shower or in the tub or out of a bucket as long as the necessary requirements of a ghusl are met then the action is a ghusl, even if it's in the rain or in a swimming pool. But as far as a bath or a shower, then these connotate to us in the English language something that is lesser than a religious reality of a ghusl. So sometimes I take a bath, but it's not a ghusl. Or somebody might think I can only take a ghusl if I'm in a tub. Or sometimes I take a shower and it's not a ghusl. Or somebody might think I can only take a ghusl while I'm taking a shower. But the reality is, is that a ghusl is a religious reality. So we need to understand that term in Arabic so that we don't get confused when we talk to others or hear what others have to say regarding the religion. So this first chapter is going to be Dhikru wujubu al al-ma'khudi farduhu min al-kitab a chapter regarding mentioning the things that the obligation of a ghusl for them has been taken from the book. I, the things that the book, the Quran, have mentioned the necessity of taking a ghusl because of them. What are the things that the Quran says and when he says the Quran, he's not saying you can't find it in the Sunnah. But what he's saying is, is that these are things that are findable in the Quran. The Quran proves these things. As opposed to the things that are only proven in the Sunnah. So the section that deals with what the Quran proves, you can find it in the Sunnah as well. But the section of what he's going to mention as it relates to what the Sunnah proves He's saying you don't find it directly stated in the Quran. So there's some things that are directly stated in the Quran and the Sunnah emphasizes them and supports them. 
And then there are some things that the Quran doesn't explicitly state that the Sunnah establishes them. And then there are some things that are neither explicitly stated in the Quran or the Sunnah, but the consensus establishes them. Meaning you won't find an ayah referencing it. And you won't find a hadith referencing it. But you'll see that all of the scholars of Islam are in agreement about that thing. And so like this, he's showing us how our tadaruj or how our systematic approach to evidence should be. Quran, Sunnah, way of the Salaf. And this is why we love this book for Islamic law. He says, this is the chapter regarding mentioning the obligation of taking a ghusl that has been derived, that its obligation has been derived from the book. The things that the book explicitly states, we need to take a ghusl because of them. He says, قال الله جل ذكره ولا جنوبا إلا عابر إلا عابري سبيلا حتى تختسلوا. Allah the the Allah exalted is His mentioning in remembrance. He said, and nor the and nor and neither in a state of sexual impurity, unless you were just passing by until you bathe. I.e., it is not permissible for you to stay in the masjid while you are intoxicated. This is the beginning of the ayah. Oh, you who have iman, don't approach the salat and you all are drunk until you know what you're saying. Because in the beginning of Islam, the Muslims were allowed to drink alcohol. And then later on, that was abrogated. But in the beginning of Islam, they were allowed to drink. And then later, Allah abrogated the permissibility of drinking or being drunk while you make salat. So you could drink as long as it wasn't time for salat. And then later on, Allah abrogated the permissibility of drinking in totality. So this ayah, this ayah that is in Surah Al-Nisa, it was originally about the second stage. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, oh you who have iman, don't approach salat. And you all are in a state of intoxication until you are able to comprehend what you're saying. Until you regain your faculties after being intoxicated and not knowing what's going on. Nor should you remain in the masjid while you are, and this is where the ayah picks, off, picks up for the author. And neither should you remain in the masjid while you were in a state of junub or janaba, while you were junuban, in a state of janaba, and this word we won't translate it because he's going to explain it, nor should you go inside of the masjid, is better, nor should you approach or go into the masjid while you were in a state of janaba, unless you were just passing through, or unless you were just passing by, until you take a ghusl, and that's why we said the definition of hadith is that which prevents you from being able to pray or things similar. You can't go into the masjid, i.e. to make salat, while you're in a state of janaba until you take a ghusl. So this janaba is a hadith. And not only is it a hadith, it's a major hadith because it requires a ghusl. And so this is the proof in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 43. The compiler or the author Abu Bakr he said, فَأَوْجَبَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ الْإِقْتِسَالَ مِنَ الْجَنَابَ وَدَلَّتِ السُّنَّةِ الثَّابِتَةُ عَلَى مِثْلِ مَا دَلَّ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابِ He says, so Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentioned the obligation of taking a ghusl for the individual who was in a state of janaba. And this is something that the sunnah, that is a that is the firm and established sunnah, has also proven. Just like it was proven by the book. He says, And all of the scholars are in agreement with it. So like we said, this first category, when he's talking about the things that are in the sunnah, I mean in the Quran, he's not saying that you can't find them in the sunnah. And that the scholars disagree about it. He's just saying that this is its its first 
source. As opposed to the things that are in the sunnah, you might not find a mentioning for them in the Quran. The sunnah would be their first source. It doesn't mean they won't be agreed about. It's just that the sunnah will be their first source. And then the things that he mentions as it's going to relate to that which is agreed about, he's saying you won't find it directly mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah for that matter, but its first source is the agreement and the consensus. So as far as being junub and that requiring you taking a ghusl, then this is in all of the sources because if it's in the Quran, it's probably going to be in all of the sources. He says, Qala wa akhbarani al-rabi' Qala qala shafi'i فَكَانَ مَعْرُوفًا فِي لِسَانِ الْعَرَبِ أَنَّ الْجَنَابَ الْجِمَاعِ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ مَعَ الْجِمَاعِ مَا أُنْدَافِقْ وَكَذَلِكَ ذَلِكَ فِي حَدِّ الزِّنَى وَإِجَابِ الْمَهْرِ وَغَيْرِهِ وَكُلُّ مَنْ خُوطِبَ بِأَنَّ فُلَانٌ أَجْنَبَ مِنْ فُلَانَ عَقِلَ أَنَّهُ أَصَابَهُ He says, and Rabi' Rabi' informed me, yani Rabi' ibn Sulaiman, the famous student of Imam al-Shafi'i. He says that al rabi informed me, he said that a shafii and what you should know, I'm saying, is that Shafi'i was a scholar of hadith, Quran, uh, 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 fiqh and usul, but even also especially language. And they used to say that Shafi'i is an evidence and establishing the meanings of words because his language was of extremely high quality. And so bringing what Shafi'i said about the meaning of a word, the Salaf, they used to recognize that this is a proof for what that word means. He was a dictionary. He was one who could explain adequ adequately and accurately the meanings of words. And this is very important in Arabic because words can sometimes be used in various ways. And so having somebody explain what the word is, is helpful, especially as it relates to the religion. So he said, Rabi' he said that a Shafi'i said, and it was well known in the Arabic tongue or on the Arabic tongue, i.e. in the Arabic language, that El Janaba, that word that we said we're not going to translate, El Janaba, and we'll translate it now because he's about to mention it, they translate it as sexual impurity. He says that it was well known on the tongue of the Arab that El Janaba is intercourse. It is to have sex. A person has Janaba when they have sex. And this sex causes them to be in a position or in a state where they are no longer able to pray or do things similar until they take a bath. And he says, and that is even if the sex does not result in that uh, 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 heavy fluid, I, that ejaculation, even if that intercourse doesn't result in ejaculation. So the simple fact that an individual has sex, then that places them in a state of janaba. If a person has intercourse, that places them in a state of janaba, even if they don't ejaculate. And here it's necessary to understand what is intercourse because this is a religious reality that rules are connected with. And a lot of people, they might be shy or ashamed to talk about it, but it's necessary that a person understands what exactly is intercourse because multiple rules are connected to it. So intercourse is the disappearing of the head of the male organ, the tip of the male organ, inside the cavity of the female organ, whether it be the front or akramakumullah, the rear. This is still considered to be sex. And even worse than that, wayadu billah, is it disappearing into the rear of a male as well, wayadu billah. So the point of it is, is that intercourse is the disappearing of the male organ, the tip, not the entirety, 
but the tip of the male organ, the the hefesha, right? The part that is circumcised. If that disappears inside the female organ, whether front or back or the organ of anything for that matter, front or back, then this is considered intercourse. This is considered intercourse. Even if an individual doesn't ejaculate. So the moment an individual organs tip disappears inside of the organ of another, then this is intercourse. And he says this is intercourse, I this this janaba being intercourse is the same as it relates to establishing the punishment of zina. Meaning it's not considered to be zina, a person hasn't committed fornication or adultery until this happens. Until the circumcised portion of the male disappears into the female or into the organ of another, whether front or back, that's when we can say they committed intercourse. But if it was something other than that, in spite of it being a sin and indecent, it doesn't come with the same punishment as intercourse. So if they kiss or they hug or they do something other than that, akramukumullah, then this doesn't count as intercourse. It doesn't make it permissible. And it doesn't mean it is okay. It just means that there is not intercourse. He says, and likewise, that which establishes the mahar, for a woman to be entitled to the entirety of the mahar, she has to be madhulan biha. She has to have had intercourse with her husband. If the husband divorces her before mentioning a mahar and before entering into her, then she isn't entitled to anything. And the husband should give her a gift upon divorce. And if he divorces her after agreeing on a mahar, but before entering into her, then she is entitled to half of it. But if he has mentioned the mahar, they have agreed on the mahar, and he has entered into her, then this is when the mahar, she is entitled to the total of it. And he, even if he divorces her directly after that, she is entitled to the entirety of the mahar. And so when do we know he has entered into her? Shafi'i is saying here that he has entered into her when he has reached a state of Janaba. And as we mentioned, Janaba is when the circumcised portion of the male organ disappears into the organ of other. Here would be the organ of the woman, the front organ of the woman. He says, or other than that, anything that has to deal with establishing has a person had intercourse or not, the way you know the person has had intercourse or not is are they in a state of Janaba? If they have reached Janaba, then they've had intercourse. If it was only for a moment, if they didn't ejaculate, it does not matter. They have had intercourse. And that intercourse prevents them from making salat or things similar. As we saw in the ayat, وَلَا جُنُوبًا hatta تَخْتَسِلُوا And you can't go to the masjid when you're in a state of Janaba until you bathe. And likewise, he said, in anything or anyone who talks about someone or addresses someone saying that so-and-so has become junub because of so-and-so, like Zaid has become junub because of uh, a Hind, right? Zaid has become junub because of Hind. What they mean is known and understood that they have had intercourse, that he has engaged with her, that he has had these physical relationships with her. Now, so this is the first thing that the Sunnah, I'm sorry, that the Quran establishes that you have to take a ghusl because of it. That is intercourse. And 
intercourse is the disappearing of the male, the circumcised portion of the male organ into the cavity of the organ of something else, whether it was a male or a I mean a female front or back or a male or even an animal, all of this would count as intercourse. Now, one beneficial thing here I like to you know mention is that this shows us that Shafi'i, he didn't consider being alone with the woman that you married in the house after you closed the door, that which removes her virginity. And this is an issue of disagreement amongst the scholars. When does a woman lose her virginity in the sight of the people? Is it when they actually have intercourse? Or is it when her and the man are alone behind closed doors? She automatically loses the value of virginity by simply disappearing alone with a, a male behind closed doors that she's married to. And obviously, uh, the statement of Shafi Alano's best might be the stronger one. But it's interesting to show us about why it's so dangerous about being alone or mixing with the opposite sex inappropriately because honor is attached to that. And they used to consider sometimes that when a man married a woman, the moment he took her into the home and closed the door, she's no longer a virgin. And so if she were to get married again, nobody would consider her to be a virgin. Uh, but, you know, the statement of Shafi is saying that it is not considered that she doesn't. In, and thus she would be entitled to the mahr. That's why it's an issue, because once he took her in the house and closed the door, she's entitled to the entirety of the mahr. But Shafi is saying, no, she's not entitled to the entirety of the mahr until he actually has relations with her. We'll stop at that amount. How the wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.